Good afternoon. My name is Kurt Fent, and I'd like to welcome you to the first Humanities Plus Digital Conference on Visual Interpretation. Um, I'm the executive director of MIT's HyperStudio for Digital Humanities, um, and this is a group that uh, explores the potential of new media for education, for research in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And it's really great to see such a great turnout despite the beautiful weather. I wish we could do the conference outside, which would be really nice, but unfortunately, that's <laughs> not going to work. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about how this conference came about. And it's very clear that uh, all aspects of visualizing data and uh, visual aspects are certainly in the air, and this is clearly a very important topic. But the idea for this conference really emerged out of the work that we do at uh, MIT's HyperStudio, uh, part of the research and part of working with on projects with faculty uh, across the different sections in, in the school. Uh, and to tell you briefly a little bit about the work. The work happens in a space that uh, Henry Jenkins, the former director of the Comparative Media Studies program, defined as um, applied humanities. And this is really an interesting fit for what we do and what some of the other research groups in the Comparative Media Studies program do. Uh, it's really looking at the process, the back and forth between theory and practice and how one can inform the other. And this really defines in a very interesting way and describes the way uh, that we work in, in HyperStudio. Uh, I just want to give you two examples from our work that really sparked also the, the, the idea about this conference on visual interpretations. And these are two projects that are uh, right now at the core of our work. One is the um, US-Iran Relations Project, and this is a project that we do with the um, Center for International Studies here at MIT. It looks at the relationship, and as you can imagine, it's quite often a troubled one, the relationship between the U.S. and Iran, uh, and uh, especially uh, the questions of how to, how to get at aspects uh, of co uh, contentious and quite often disputed uh, debates about certain issues, about certain dates and events that happen, because as you can imagine, looking at these uh, aspects from different points of view, from an American point of view, from an Iranian point of view, you get very different uh, aspects and really different different ideas and different readings of what has been happening between the two countries. The other project I want to mention is a project that we do with Jeff Ravel in the History Department, and that's the Comédie Française Registers project. It looks at the theatrical history of the Comédie Française, the most important theater troupe in, in, in France, or at least in a historical sense. Um, and looking at their performance data over about 120, 130 years, what's really interesting is that this data uh, changes over time. So how do you deal with that, with this kind of changing data that changes um, through the centuries, through the decades, uh, brings in other kinds of information, but at the same time it's an invaluable source for looking at uh, the theater history, and also it, uh, looking at the data allows us to really change the way we understand French theater history and the history of cultural production in, in France in the 17th and 18th century very differently. So coming out of the, the, the projects, developing these projects and doing some of our research, it became really clear that the tools that have been around are not really very well suited to uh, deal with, on the one hand, disputed uh, data or data with different perspectives, and also it's not very good at looking at data that changes over time and uh, and represents these data in, in still a very meaningful way. So in looking around, of course, you one looks at other uh, disciplines, and clearly the arts come to mind uh, that visualize the, the artistic process. Uh, it's the natural sciences very clearly, and as you might have seen at the Broad Institute just across the street, uh, the visualization of the sequences of the genome um, uh, sequence and uh, is a very interesting uh, visualization that allows new insights and new understandings into the workings of, of 
uh, the genome structure. But it's also computer science and, and uh, user interface design that who have, of course, long dealt with these issues, but from a, from a different angle. So the question is, how can we bring these aspects into rethinking the tools that allow us to do research, uh, to even change education in a very interesting way, bringing in other aspects of interpretation into looking at data and data visualization. Uh, and of course, you know, how can we use these tools to move from uh, knowledge representation also to knowledge interpretation? Um, one aspect that we should not forget, of course, is looking back at history. Uh, there are many great examples for data visualization. Uh, and of course, at that time, it wasn't called uh, data visualization, but it was you know, maps that represent a view of the world. Uh, different kinds of genealogies and other aspects that really, sh on the one hand, helped people understand the world, but also shaped that understanding uh, of, of the world at that time. Um, as you could see from the program, uh, we have five keynote speakers in total, which is quite amazing for a three-day conference. Um, so they all prominently represent you know, some of these aspects that I just mentioned. And in addition, we have 60, uh, a total of 60 papers, short presentations, workshops, demos, uh, poster sessions, um, and all these approach the aspects of visual interpretation from a very interesting cross-disciplinary uh, point of view, as you will see over the course of the next two days. Um, and I'm sure at the, end, at the end of the conference, we will have hopefully a better understanding of these aspects, the issues that will be raised. Uh, we will hopefully have new ideas, uh, hopefully know what we need to do next, but also think more importantly, have many more questions what we should do next. So enjoy the conference. So before I introduce our next speakers, let me thank some people, quite a few, uh, who have been instrumental in bringing this uh, conference together, bringing it to life. Um, first of all, let me thank the Hyper Studio staff. Uh, first of all, Gabriella Horvath. I'm not quite sure if she's here. Uh, she's out uh, still at the desk, probably. Um, she has been really amazing in putting all the different pieces together, holding the strings so that nothing get lost. Uh, Anna Van Sommeren, our um, project and, and research manager, who just joined the team, who was thrown into cold water, but learn to stay on top very quickly. Uh, our two software developers, Dave De La Costa and Brett Barrows. Uh, and of course, and you could see you know, two signs up here. One is the MIT Communications Forum. The other one is the Hyper Studio sign. Uh, Brett Siegel, uh, who is uh, representing the MIT Communications Forum. He's an amazing conference organizer. And also Andrew Whitaker uh, from CMS, um, our uh, communication wizard, our resident communication wizard. Um, and then we have two student um, helpers, uh, Andrea Robles and Lyndia Williams. Uh, and of course, last but not least, let me thank uh, the, our alumni donors without whom this conference would not have been possible and certainly it would not have been free. Um, so, let me introduce our first speaker, and that's Deborah Fitzgerald. Uh, she's the Kanan Sahin Dean of the uh, School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. She has always been a great supporter of uh, digital humanities at MIT, of CMS, and of HyperStudio. And afterwards, we will hear uh, some brief remarks by uh, Peter Donaldson, who is professor in literature uh, and Shakespeare scholar, uh, creator of the uh, Shakespeare Electronic Archive, uh, and now the Global Shakespeare uh, Archive, and faculty director of HyperStudio, longtime supporter and collaborator in all things digital. Deborah, please. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, 
Well, listen, it's just a great pleasure to be here uh, to welcome you to MIT on behalf of not only the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences, but I think the, the, the entire place is, is just very happy to be part of this historic conference. I want to thank Kurt. Uh, as well as the sponsors for putting this together. It's, um, it's a, it, I'm excited to be part of it. Um, MIT, as you, as you know, those of you who are from MIT and, and those of you who are from outside, MIT is an experimental culture at its very heart. It's what we're about. And I think that the hands-on experiential learning components of what goes on uh, within the labs and the classrooms at MIT is really at the heart of what makes it distinctive. And that's no less true in the humanities, arts, and social sciences than it is in science and engineering and business and the other um, great parts of the institute. But sometimes it's, it's hard to keep in mind that the experimental is a good place to be. It's a little scary, I think, for many of us as a historian. I can say I'm, I'm fairly traditional in my research methods. But I'm drawn um, like a moth to the flame when it comes to digital humanities, as I think many of us are in a process of transitioning to something very exciting and very new. Uh, well, actually, very exciting and not so very new, just new to some people like me. Um, but clearly, digital humanities and visual interpretation needs to be what we are supporting and growing, certainly as administrators. This is, this is where things are moving very quickly and with, with a lot of um, great excitement. And it's not only as supplements to textual analysis, which is often the kind of con conversations um, I, get, I get sort of drawn into, but really as in terms of creating entirely new, new forms of scholarly and cultural communication. Um, that's the that's the sort of larger frame in which I'd like to see us move. And uh, all of you who are, who are academics in the humanities fields know that this is a, a very exciting, exhilarating, terrifying, um, wonderful future that we are uh, making now. So I'm just delighted that we're having these conversations here at MIT. I wish you a very good conference. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be even briefer. I'm Pete Donaldson. I'm the faculty director of Hyper Studio, and I want to welcome all the distinguished uh, plenary speakers and attendees here. It's, it's really, I can say this because Kurt has done by so far mo most of the work that I can stand apart from it and say uh, this is a, as exciting a conference as I think I've ever uh, been at the start of, and uh, it's at a pivotal moment. Uh, visualization and visual media are at the very, very center of transformations in the humanities. We're at a time when knowledge and the sharing of knowledge about them are absolutely critical for the advancement of the field and for, the, the, for creating the most healthy path for the humanities as we engage the digital age in the coming years. It's very exciting. I expect one wonderful things out of it. I'm delighted to be a part of it. Welcome, and um, we proceed with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and, and Pete. So now we switch over to the first session uh, of the conference, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Joanna Drucker to this conference. It's, she's clearly a preeminent scholar who we've looked for a very long time you know, for inspiration for our work, and it's a really great pleasure to have her here. This first session, um, as you can see, as I pointed out before, is a double feature. You know, this is part uh, of the MIT Communications Forum, but it's also the opening keynote of the Humanities Plus Digital Conference. Um, and so let me just quickly introduce uh, Joanna first, and then after her talk, I'll introduce our two respondents. Um, Joanna is clearly among the core scholars uh, who rethink what it means to do humanities research in digital environments, and I'm very glad that she has been able to join us for this conference. Joanna is the Martin and Bernard Breslauer Professor of Bibliography in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA. Her research and teaching focuses on electronic scholarship, digital aesthetics, and visual information design. 
In 2008 and 2009, she was the Digital Humanities Fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center, where she worked on a project titled Diagramming Interpretation. Do you see a connection here? <laughs> Uh, she was one of the co-founders of the Speculative Computing Laboratory at the U University of Virginia, a research group dedicated to exploring experimental projects in digital humanities. She has published extensively on the history of written forms, typography, design, and visual poetics. In addition to her scholarly work, uh, Joanna is internationally known as a book artist uh, and an experimental visual poet Recent titles include Sweet Dreams, Contemporary Art and Complicity, Chicago 2005, Graphic Design History, A Critical Guide that she did with Emily McVarish in 2008, Testament of Women, 2006, and Combo Meals, 2008. Her recent book, Spec Lab, Digital Aesthetics and Speculative Computing, uh, University of Chicago Press 2009, has been, as I mentioned, very inspirational for our work in HyperStudio. As she describes the concept of speculative computing in SpecLab, she moves beyond the instrumental, well-formed, and increasingly standardized business of digital humanities. She and her team use computers to create, and I love that term, visual provocations, visual, verbal, textual results that were surprising uh, and unpredictable. But most importantly, uh, her group introduced the notion of subjectivity and point of view into digital environments as the basis of an interpretive and expressive representation, an argument that without doubt will be part of many discussions throughout this conference. So join me in welcoming Joanna Drucker. Just hit B. Oh, it works. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and, and among such distinguished company, uh, presenters and audience alike, I'm sure. I am a humanist, and I think it's good to remember the historical roots of humanism in the Renaissance because it represents um, a task and role to preserve and migrate cultural legacy from an earlier medium into print and all that that implies, but also to uh, change the episteme and to replace a sort of uh, God-centered universe with one in which the human scale and the human point of view um, are the defining characteristics of meaning production and relevance. And so I think when we think about humanism now, we're coming back to it after a period of enlightenment and empirical science and the, domin and, and the dominance of another episteme. And it is really in contrast to that that I think the um, rehumanization of digital uh, activities may take place. I'm not post-human, resolutely not, um, and so uh, I, I will state my position at the outset. Um, as I said, I think the task of the humanist here, and as I, as I put my um, uh, title together, I was calling it the graphical expression of humanistic interpretation in digital environments, and I decided forgot this part, uh, forgot, decided to modify that slightly and to call it humanistic approaches to the graphical expression of interpretation. Many of you familiar with the work of Edward Tufte will note the paraphrase here, um, it's deliberate. Humanistic approaches will be the mo motif according to which I outline some of the points I'm going to make. Graphical expression is central to what our collective activity and engagement is here. And interpretation for me is going to mark the domain in which I, again, introduce another epistemological shift, which I identify by the rubric from data to capta. And you'll see what I mean by that as I move ahead. As visualization techniques have been adopted by digital humanists, they have tended to come out of the field of empirical sciences and quantitative uh, analytics. And not by accident, since it is in that domain that the visualization techniques for giving uh, visualization to 
quantitative information were most expertly developed. Again, I have complete respect for those domains and for the work they did, but unfortunately, as we see this migration into the humanities, I find there's a kind of naive empiricism on the part of humanists in their adaptation of these particular techniques. Right here you see a piece by Chris Foster, which is um, mining obscenity, um, failure with visualizations, I'm glad he called it a failure, um, and uh, this is a search for the word bitch through uh, canonical authors, and so it's a statistical um, analysis search simply of a, of a particular ASCII stream and so forth. So we see this kind of um, uh, technique, and we see stuff that has slightly more sophistication to it in terms of the modeling of what's being searched, but then it's also equally problematic, or perhaps even more so. Here is a, um, a, a visualization done in, in the Nora visualization suite, again, a project for which I have tremendous respect, um, but I think, again, my arguments are really against the um, epistemological assumptions that are at work here. Um, and this is a project called um, the Exploring Erotics in Emily Dickinson's Correspondence, and it's uh, uh, the Nora visualization and done also with the work of Catherine Plaisant and James Rose and others. In this project, rather than simply doing a quantitative search um, for an ASCII stream, what's gone on is that the tagged uh, corpus of Emily Dickinson's work, an already interpreted set of materials, is given a visual form. So these are two very different kinds of projects, obviously. One is a kind of you know, raw data processing, quote unquote, and the other is the uh, rep visual representation of already interpreted according to humanistic tag sets um, materials. So what is the problem here and why, why um, is it a problem? My sense is that there's a statistical naivete that's at work here, um, and uh, part of the problem is what is being parameterized and why? And if you were to look into the literature in uh, science and technology studies or the sociology of knowledge or any of the fields that deal with um, you know, scientific uh, visualization and, and critiques of, of uh, the, of quantitative studies, and I'm thinking here of the work of Bruno Latour, or the work of Margot Anderson, then you'd find a much more sophisticated understanding of how statistical means have to operate at the outset. So there's a kind of sense on the part of humanists that if you can count it and then you can show how many of something there is in a visualization, that it's so, oh wow, isn't that cool, that they don't remember that they are actually humanists. So they are somehow wowed by this visualization. Now we could correct this to some extent by introducing more sophisticated statistical modeling. And here's another example. We could say, for, but it's not going to solve the problem. It would just help a bit. Um, so it's a big problem, so it's going to need a lot of help. Okay, so, um, but we could start by having more complicated um, statistical models. So, for instance, supposing I want to, this is a chart made by um, my designer, Zarina Skander. Supposing I want to chart the number of novels that were uh, put into print in a single, by a single publisher across a number of years, say 1855 to 1861. Well, I can do a little bar chart and, and you know, list the number of, of titles that come into print. Wow, is that dumb. Okay, so that is completely without any of the kind of intellectual apparatus that humanists bring to the analysis of history, the history of publishing books, and so forth. So let's complicate this. All right. So we're going to, instead of showing the number of titles simply in a year, understand that a book doesn't come into being just in the year in which it's published. That as a matter of fact, there's a gestation period. You can see those little spermatozoa giving rise to books. Okay, so there's a gestation period, a development period, an acquisition period, a publication period, and some of these books are aborted, not to push the analogy too far. And so that basically, when we're looking at the statistical model, suddenly it becomes a lot more interesting. Things don't just appear in a year the nature of a year, the nature of publishing, and the nature of a book are all problematized according to some degree of humanistic inquiry. So that would already be somewhat of an improvement to use this kind of fuzzy um, graphics um, in which data are shown as a composite rather than a singularity. However, I think we have a deeper problem to address here, and it is not simply a matter of modeling humanistic statistics, right, and giving them more sophistication, but instead, as I said, shifting the epistemological ground. Um, 
And that is a really serious problem. And that is the place in which I believe the humanities have a serious and substantial role that is cultural as well as intellectual in pushing back against the dominant models of a kind of quantitative um, and empirical approach. So what would that look like? What are the issues? This is not simply an opposition between quantitative and qualitative methods, not at all. That's extremely simplistic. Instead, what I want to suggest is that humanistic interpretation is never about self-identical objects. It is always about observer-dependent and codependent relations between phenomena and their constitution in a constructivist model. In other words, what we have to do here is switch our notion of knowledge from knowledge to knowing and borrow from the kind of cognitive studies approaches that come out of Maturana and Varela, Eleanor Roche, and that really are grounded in an opposition between a realist model of knowledge and a constructivist model of knowledge. So it's that shift that I'm really trying to advocate here. And to do that, we have to really question certain fundamental assumptions about how we know what we know. Oh, I didn't talk about this piece. So here's a problematic um, uh, visualization and problematic on several levels. So again, a, a fascinating and interesting project. It's a visualization that was done by um, uh, students at Stanford to work with the Republic of Letters group. And what the Republic of Letters group is trying to show is the correspondence networks um, that existed from about 1660 to about 1800 um, in Europe around Enlightenment figures exchanges through the mails. And so the points of origins and the points of reception are uh, encoded in the metadata of the um, materials that are being uh, processed here. And the visualization was generated to show this traffic, this kind of movement of uh, correspondence from one site in Europe to another in this particular period. Now, there's a number of issues here, of course. Now, this is 1629 to 1834, 1824. I can't see it from here. So, first of all, what map of Europe? Europe? Countries? Help me out? Okay. So, there's a few little issues there. Then there's the idea that, um, I don't know about you, but I just sort of have a hard time remembering airmail in that particular period of time, or air traffic. So there's a way that this visualization reifies a notion of correspondence networks according to at a completely anachronistic model, as if letters simply travel from one point to another without circuitous routes, without all kinds of encounters, without all kinds of difficulties that have to do with the experiential reality of the space-time continuum within a historical frame. So again, the, the humanistic you know, sort of framework suddenly falls away, which in itself would not be so problematic, except that the reifying rhetorical force of visualizations is so powerful that we look at this and go, ah, that's the correspondence network, and it so isn't, for instance. Okay. So how do we go about making these kinds of changes? How do we shift from an observer-independent notion of self-evident knowledge to an observer-codependent notion of emergent uh, conditions of knowing? And how would we visualize that? Well, we took on um, experimenting with this, and I mean, certainly I haven't solved this problem, but we took on this experimentation in looking at um, temporality in our temporal modeling project at the University of Virginia. And also we've been looking a bit at spatiality, um, as well as texts, archives, and the acts of reading. So basically space, time, and texts. That seems like it'll keep us busy for um, a good long time. Um, to define temporality is to already make an, uh, a decision about a distinction between um, long-held philosophical concepts in which the idea of time is taken as an a priori, a given, a container. Temporality is understood as constituted, relational, situated, and experiential. Space and spatiality have the same opposition. I would now define this distinction as saying spatiality or temporality are always time as a factor of X, space as a factor of X, in which X is any experiential coefficient. Fear, anxiety, uh, difficulty, um, you know, political conditions, whatever. You can take that X and, and, and sophisticate it through any number of variables that you would like. When we began the Temporal Modeling Project, which is 10 years ago, Bethany Nowitzki and I looked at the history of time and its representations, timelines, 
and essentially decided that the models that came out of the empirical sciences and that were used for social sciences as well were grounded in several basic assumptions that time is unidirectional, goes in one direction only, that it is homogeneous, that is all elements of time are the same and can be measured according to a standard metric, and that it is continuous, that it has no breaks or ruptures. None of those things are true in humanistic experience, and they're certainly not true across the corpus of humanistic documents in which the representation of temporality encounters a distinct dis distinctions between that which is on the plane of discourse and that which is on the plane of reference. So for a humanist, this kind of timeline hunting large game um, from 2000 BC to 2000 AD is actually not very useful. The concept of temporality is not in play here, but rather a notion of time. So how are we going to go about um, making these uh, transformations? How are we going to visualize temporality and temporal relations? Well, there are, as Kurt mentioned, many wonderful examples in the history of um, representation before it became so standardized in the natural sciences that we can go back to and look at. Those of you interested in looking at timelines in the revolution might do well to look at this publication recently appeared cart um, called Cartographies of Time by Daniel Rosenberg and Anthony Grafton. It contains many interesting interesting visualizations, but we searched in vain to find the kinds of things that would allow us to represent time as probabilistic, as potential, as having these kinds of bifurcations, ruptures, and discontinuities, and non-standard metrics within it. If you look in that cartographies of time, what's interesting is that the only representation of probabilistic time is this particular example from Charles Renouvier's Uchronie of 1876. For those of you having trouble reading this graph, since it's not self-evident, this is actually an image of history as it might have been as well as as it has been in his particular um, utopian novel. Um, well. Uh, it actually has relations to Minkowski diagrams and to potentialities of temporality that have been mapped in theoretical physics and so forth. But believe it or not, even with our adventurous imagination and desire to sort of shock everybody, we had trouble using Minkowski diagrams to diagram anything that we were familiar with. What were we trying to diagram? We were trying to diagram several things. Experience from a humanistic perspective and then the representation of experience within humanistic documents. Keeping those two registers clear is essential, though I would argue the same principles apply. So if you look at Tristram Shandy and uh, Lawrence Stern's opening uh, gambit here, and you see that Shandy is actually mapping in this uh, set of digressions, his diagrams of digressions, the tension between a plane of discourse and a plane of reference. The time of his telling is singular, continuous and homogeneous, more or less, across the course of his text. But on the plane of discourse, which is what these digressions actually map, the temporality is winding, twisty, well, twisty little passages, as a matter of fact, to quote somebody else who's present. So understanding that distinction is significant as well. Bethany and I then set out to try to think about how we might map temporality by including various kinds of relational propositions, some syntactic inflections, causality, foreshadowing, anticipation, and regret, and to make them into some kind of a system where those kinds of influences could be shown. We were working within an XML environment, so I have to say our sketches at the outset were more successful to my mind than the actual platform that we built, though the platform had its virtues and its, and its benefits. It was a graphical display for generating knowledge that get generated XML structured output. So that was an important move within the digital humanities community that was largely text-based, believed in tagging first and looking afterwards. Um, and we were trying to demonstrate the priority of a visual model for creating epistemology. We made this particular system with all kinds of uh, possibilities for bifurcated timelines, um, event glows, uh, casting shadows of foreshortening, anticipation, and regret, and came up with an entire system of elements and entities, behaviors, and tasks, and again built this in actually a flash-based program environment. But the constraints of XML hindered us from doing the kinds of things that I would really love to see done with this project, and that is to morph the Cartesian grid in ways that it can't be as long as you're exporting structured XML. 
Here's a, one of the original early sketches in which we're looking at this issue of non-homogeneous time. And non-homogeneous time is simply the experience you have every day. There, there are days in which you get up in the morning, you go to leave for work, you have 15 minutes, and you can make your breakfast, go for a run, you know, wash the cat's bowl, um, you know, read two chapters that you were supposed to do the night before, grade your students' papers, do a whole bunch of email, and you look at your watch and you still have five minutes. That's a day when the time tides are running very slowly. All right, other days you get up and all you do is tie your shoes and you're already 10 minutes late. And that's a day when the time tides are running very fast. So temporality, because it's relational, is never standard. And this is a sketch showing the different kinds of temporalities that emerge from a diff different situations. Likewise, when we're looking at this relationship between plane of reference, the telling, and plane of discourse, uh, I'm sorry, a plane of uh, reference, the told, and the, and the plane of discourse, the telling, that the fragments, the, fig you know, the, the ruptures, the overlaps in any discourse field um, need to be projected differently onto a, onto a timeline to create its temporal uh, form. We're looking at the multiplicities of temporality within experiential environments as well as representational uh, fields and thinking about what we call the now slider, that little glow in the upper corner there, which is a point of view system. And we began to introduce systematically point of view into our model to say that temporality is always experienced from somebody's subjective inner standing point and that in any complex system like a family event, there are multiple points of view at any given time and that the temporalities organize themselves around those subject positions. Again, our final resolution was far more linear than our original vision. Um, it seems to me now that if I think about how we could model this, we need, you know, topological mathematics, among other things, in order to have a kind of rubber sheet uh, uh, landscape in which to work. And we needed more sophisticated modeling tools than we had at our disposal. Um, so if you're going to actually take temporal sequences and bend them around a point of view, you're going to need a way to do that that isn't going to end up being structured as XML output because it just isn't going to uh, map onto that. Many of the speculative images that we did that had to do with warping time and timelines according to heavy events and difficult events and, and angles of, of you know, anxiety didn't make it into our final models at that point, but I have incorporated them now into some new little graphical um, experiments that we've been doing. And in the new version of temporal modeling, what we're trying to do is three things, and these map across temporality, spatiality, and also the textual environments. The first thing is to say, can we make graphical representations of humanistic data? Well, that's pretty easy, and here's an example. Humanistic data is data inflected with affect. It's not data, it's CAPTA. What is CAPTA? What is the difference between data and CAPTA? Hmm, data comes from the word taken, I mean given, I'm sorry, data comes from the word datum, given. It assumes there is an a priori pre-existing universe, observer independent, that you simply take, that you quantify. What is CAPTA? CAPTA is taken. CAPTA suggests that all quantification, parameterization, representation is always about an experiential codependent relationship of emergent phenomena. The phenomena don't exist outside of the cognitive perception and the perception is intervening in and influenced by the phenomena. Codependent and emergent, observer codependent phenomena are CAPTA. So here are CAPTA. If you're going to have humanistic inflected information in a chart, it's affective. It's already marked by affect. So here's somebody's weekly schedule. It's my student, so I know she left out a lot. Um, so this is the cleaned up version of her CAPTA calendar, right, with events weighted according to the amount of time they took up. Here's her, um, you know, hideously annoying graphic that she hates uh, entirely, but I made her allow me to keep it, which is what if we want to put an affective spin on the representation? In the first case, we have affective data being given a representation. Here we have an affective display of data. So the actual display is given an inflection. In the final version, however, what we do is we take the notion of humanistic inflection and interpretation and use it to generate the non-standard metric. This is another move yet beyond that. Here we have actual time in a timetable of trains going from a train going from one station to another along a route. What happens when the route 
is actually changed according to the perceived time. Then the temporal metric is actually inflected by the experience. Codependent system emerges. So this is the kind of um, a humanistic approach to the construction of a graphical expression. It's not merely a graphical expression of humanistic information. And that shift seems to me to be fundamental to what we're trying to achieve. So we've done this now with a series of what we call temporal transforms um, in which we're taking these graphs. I mean, they're totally wacky, okay? But nonetheless, this is a, an attempt to systematize um, this kind of um, inflected activity. So here you have a chart showing a, an amount of anxiety mapped over time in a continuous graph on the top and on a, uh, you know, a, a sort of uh, a discrete state graph on the bottom. All right, so they, they're actually showing the same information but in two different forms. Now, if you take the um, discrete state graph and you just take the area of difference, the area of change from one state to the other, you can generate, again, this is just using the graphics to generate something. You can generate these forms. You see them on the bottom. Okay, so we have the difference in anxiety. And now we take anxiety difference, put it at the top, and project it down in order to make a non-standard grid, which is perceived time. So perceived time is time as a factor of the difference in level of anxiety, temporality, time as a factor of X. You can take this further and look at the change in angle and the intensification of anxiety, and then you can create um, a, an anxiety intensity graph, changing the metric on the left-hand side, merge these together, and you'll see that perceived anxiety and perceived time become a projection of that angle downward to alter the metric. So again, what we're doing is saying you can use a kind of systematic mode of metrical analysis to generate a non-standard metric. And you can do the same thing for spatiality as well. So you have perceived space and you have actual space and perceived space. So you see these kinds of transformations. Spatial transformations, again, like temporal transformations, are space as a factor of X. In this case, this is a, a, a map by Dickens and Lloyd in which they've redrawn the shape of, um, of England and uh, environs as a factor of the amount of time travel for, to get from space spot to spot. I had Zarin do a number of these kinds of transformations as well. She looked at um, the anxiety that's produced by trying to move letters across boundaries and across different kinds of terrains. It introduces a kind of you know, skew into the shape of Europe, and then in the end, that skew becomes actually a completely transformed geographical form, space as a factor of difficulty of travel, degrees of you know, uh, encounter with obstacles, and so forth. So again, it's not space as a given, but space as a codependent emergent phenomenon. Um, another little experiment with this is just the kind of, you know, implosion on the Cartesian grid. This is, you know, an experience I watched happen on the beach um, in L.A. where a, a boat came up and was wrecked. The open space of the beach became charged in a particular zone. And then fences, boundaries, and all kinds of activities began to accrue around it. And that zone took on so many micro zones that the whole space around it became highly charged, morphed, and warped. So in coming to the end here, then, I just want to finish with a couple of remarks about how these notions of the um, representation of a humanistic experience transfers into a humanistic foundation for doing representation, and look at that in the realm of interpretation and acts of reading, since that is, again, so much of what we are concerned with. I come back to our familiar object, the book, as a page, printed text, still with us in spite of everything. And here's a picture of poesis, um, a site of one of my early textual experiences and the recognition that a book was not, in fact, a stable space, but a snapshot across a community network of exchanges. Lo and behold, footnotes, marginalia, commentary. I suddenly understood a text is not a thing. It is a site of contention, debate, and social exchange in a snapshot moment. That understanding, however, is not the common understanding. I think we tend to look at static media as if they were fixed, final, and self-evident things. They are not. They are not self-evident. They are provocations for performance. Every act of reading performs a work. It makes the work. It constitutes the work. When we look at a page, when we read it, this is what we're doing. We're making associations and connections. We are constituting the text through the act of reading. You have only to go to the movies with somebody else and talk about it afterwards to know that the text is not determined 
determine the reading. Oh, Heathcliff, he's so bad. Oh, Heathcliff, he's so great. Okay, so, you know, subjectivity is the central act of performing the text. Um, this is a, a, an image of that activity and a kind of parallax view to show that the text is never self-identical with the performance of the reading. This is not the plane of discourse and the plane of reference issue that comes out of classical semiotics. This is cognitive studies, the performative activity of the text. How is a text performed? How does it make itself? How does it work? How do we model it? How do we model interpretation and show its form in graphical expression? This is an image of a text being produced from a book as a reading, and it has a surprising relationship to models that come out of catastrophe theory, initial conditions, highly significant to the production of outcomes. So I think we go to catastrophe theory for one of our models. We also go to stochastic processes and their non-deterministic complex um, uh, sort of mathematical inclusion of multiple variables that cannot be controlled. So meteorology and the modeling of fluid dynamics of the atmosphere is my favorite um, an analogy for this kind of operation. But of course, we are not modeling only experience and natural phenomena. We are modeling the relationship between an experience and a performance of interpretation and a pre-existing text, a representation. So this image of the microclimate within a cityscape seems very useful as a way to think about this. So in closing then, I would say that these are the kinds of mathematical models that we need to begin to generate the graphics that we want to see as images of interpretation. It makes a lot of my humanistic colleagues very nervous. They feel happier with standard metrics and empirical graphs in which they have an illusion of certainty about what they're doing. I have no such illusion and therefore I don't have that anxiety. Um, and, and quite the contrary, I'm actually interested in the idea that if we recenter humanistic experience at the center of the interpretive uh, model, we do something that is important, as I said, culturally as well as intellectually, which is to claim that, that um, information uh, statistical information, quantitative information, qualitative information, and their representation are only significant within a human framework. And so I end with this particular image, which is the image of Snow's map of the cholera epidemic, a canonical image in, in information visualization for good reason, because it produced um, a useful insight into the nature of this epidemic. But I say if we humanize it, one of the things we must do is to replace perspective, the human scale, the point of view, the situatedness of human experience within this social and cultural order and its representation in visual and graphical form. Thank you. Joanna, thanks a lot for this very inspiring talk and lots of interesting questions and <laughs> remarks that will come from that. So let me briefly introduce um, our respondents. Um, on the right-hand side, or left-hand side actually, uh, you see Amber Frit Jimenez. Uh, she's a designer uh, and educator who builds experiences, installations and sites that confront issues ranging from politics and surveillance to representations of women in media. Her recent work includes interactive video installations, performance-based participation from large-scale uh, online audiences, and print design. Um, Amber is currently teaching courses uh, on network cultures at the intersection of art, uh, design and critical theory at the new MIT program for art, culture, and technology and also the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, Amber is a 2010 fellow, research fellow at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht uh, in the Netherlands and has been just appointed, which is really great news, uh, an associate professor at the Kunsthochschule in Bergen, uh, in Bergen, the Bergen National Academy of the Arts in Norway, starting the fall in the fall 2010. 
she has presented her work internationally at institutions including Banff New Media Institute in Alberta, Canada, uh, Cornell University, Harvard University, Smithsonian Institution, Time Warner, Toshiba, uh, Toshiba Research and Development Lab in Tokyo and Japan, the American Institute of Graphic Arts, and at independent venues such as Art Interactive, uh, Upgrade International, and DFN Gallery in New York City. Uh, Amber is a graduate here, the Me MIT Media Lab, where she studied with John Maeda in physical language, uh, in the physical language workshop. Prior to be, uh, beginning her degree, she researched and designed interactive software to research through um, and visualize large, uh, large bodies of text in the cognitive machines group here at MIT. Um, Amber also has been organizing really interesting uh, conversations together with um, Ute Meta Bauer in the visual uh, arts program on, on uh, mapping controversies and and what was the other contested cities or <laughs> several yeah in, in that realm so it's a really interesting series that many speakers the next respondent um, Nick Monford colleague here at MIT is Associate Professor of Digital Media in the Program in Writing and Humanistic Studies. He earned uh, his PhD in Computer and Information Science from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Nick develops computer games, uh, is a critic, theorist, and scholar, and computational art and media. But he also writes poems, text generators, and interactive fiction, and has collaborated on projects such, such as the group blog Grand Text Auto, or 2002, A Palindrome Story. More recently, his work has focused on platform studies and is one of the first outcomes of his research is the book that he and Ian Bogost uh, wrote, Racing the Beam, the Atari Video Computer System, 2009, MIT Press. Um, Nick also wrote what um, Johanna just mentioned, Twisty Little Passages, an approach to interactive fiction in 2003. Uh, and has co-edited the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 1, in 2006, and many of you probably know, The New Media Reader, by, uh, published by MIT Press in 2003. So I'd like to welcome you and encourage you to discuss uh, Joanna's talk. Well, first of all, thank you, <laughs> Joanna. I think that was uh, in, in incredibly inspiring. Uh, I come from the sort of the, the more practical des uh, design sort of side, so I, for me this is extremely tight um, theory, um, very dense and thoughtful. I think uh, one of the one of the interesting things that you point out, I think, is that um, uh, to really push against the quantitative approach, but I think you're much more nuanced in how you, in how you present that. And to really think about um, how we construct, different ways we construct uh, knowledge. So um, one of the questions I had f for you is, um, to what extent, um, or can we go in, into, directly into questions? Yeah, sure. uh, to what extent uh, you see a kind of a, um, I think that there's been a kind of a growth in the number of designers and artists who are uh, entering this field of understanding how to create different kinds of interpretive visual systems uh, to tackle um, the kinds of data that we interact with every day on Google and uh, Twitter and uh, as well as a, a sort of large scale databases um, um, at various governmental websites. How, how do you see how do you see um, the kind of community of designers being able to tackle these questions? In other words, um, can we think about ways to engage um, the participation the engage, uh, of, um, of artists to, to look at these issues, and, and, and can we systematize that, or is it just a messy business? Well, my sense is that you probably know better than I do some of the people who are doing this work. I mean, I, I know, I, I look pretty systematically at what's going on, you know, I try to pay attention to the um, interesting uh, experiments in visualization. I would say um, the, it, we do have some 
we, we need to experiment, but we also need, in a way, to conventionalize and standardize. And I know that will sound sort of uh, conservative in a way, but I do think that recognizing how we introduce subjectivity and how we show subjectivity um, is really important so that this, in other words, look at the history of perspectival systems and we look at the history of drawing conventions for architecture or for other kinds of spatial representation. And there are m modes of representation that mark their subjectivity and ones that don't. And again, that distinction between the marked and the unmarked is, you know, a, a long-standing one within textual analysis as well as within visual analysis. And I think that the, that, that distinction is important to maintain um, and to indicate, to have a system of showing from where is something being produced. Because as soon as you know the place from which something's being produced, then you place it within, you know, a set of cultural relations. And, you know, it's like ideology 101. Who made it? For whom? For what purpose? So it's so basic, but really without that, the um, representation, whether it's visual or textual, seems to it have a life of its own as if it is simply the thing itself. And it's that thing that presents itself as the thing itself that we know is the first point of intervention in any cultural analysis, because nothing is simply self-identical. So I think show, figuring out conventions for showing how subjectivity is rooted, not just within individual experience, because that's only marginally interesting, but within the system of cultural and social relations of, that constitute us is also really important. And when you, I smiled when you said, oh, and those large data sets on government sites. And it's like, exactly, like where, 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 where is one? Um, within those um, environments, where are we? What it, we, you know, where is the human scale within this large um, world that we in inhabit? That's just by way of saying yes. <laughs> 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 Show me, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Nick, do you want to? Sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to actually. Uh, do you need uh, your cord? Yeah, plug in here. Maybe I can, I can ask a question in, in between. Uh, you just alluded to that in, in your, your um, final remark here, uh, and that has to do, you know, a lot of the examples that you showed, you know, showed so, sort of the individual experience with time. You know, sort of what do we do with sort of a communal, because you know, also referring to Amber's uh, remark, you know, kind of looking at larger data sets where people interact with each other, you know, sort of the aspects of networks, how that is functioning. So how do we get that in t into the mix? Because that also represents experiences, but in a, in a much more complex way. Again, I, I would go to, you know, um, systems theory and complexity theory for the models that actually allow us to see um, emergent nodes of attention and um, interest and contention, um, while also, as we know, never, you know, I, I, you don't want to leave out outliers. I mean, we all know that it's the analogies, I, I mean, it's the anomalies, it's the, it's the places that break, it's the things that don't fit that also tell us things that are really crucial and, and significant. So, you know, one of the problems, I think, with a lot of the aggregation methods of visualization is they tend to privilege the herd behavior, the kind of crowd at the center of crowdsourcing. And ultimately, most of the things that interest me in the world, you know, are the things that aren't interesting to, to those people. So it's sort of like, okay, what books haven't been checked out of the library in a hundred years? Those are the ones I want, you know? It's, <laughs> it's, it's because, well, it's, it's just, you know, that, it, that it's just a fact, you know, that there are many things that um, generate interest through a kind of, you know, sociology of attention or media attention, but that that tends, especially in our, you know, weird celebrity culture where there's the, the one and then the none, um, that, you know, the many are of, of interest. So I think, figuring out how to not let um, the anomalies and the idio, you know, the sort of really um, interesting um, individual idiosyncratic elements be lost in those mm -hmm. kinds of aggregation models. Mm -hmm. It's one of the problems. You, you, um, one of the last um, things that you said was that I thought was so um, nice is that text is a site for um, contestation. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I mean, that to me that brings up this sort of the, the written, the book, you know, is a site for um, uh, is a contested space, you know, uh, and it's in a way it's a, a center for dialogue, and it, um, it, it kind of an, um, at the center of a lot of disagreements and, and problems that we have. So the que so I wonder if we can think of those data sets in the same way, and in that 
uh, or a large scale data set in the same in the same way, and then um, develop a system that might be able to change over time, um, focused right. on those kinds of dialogues that are produced. Well, I guess I, the question is, what is the purpose of the representation and the visualization? And again, one of the things that um, I guess I, I'm trying to sort of shift here in talking about this epistemic model from knowledge to knowing, from the um, notion of a kind of totality of something that exists to something that is always experiential and that is always about performance and process, is that there's, there is in the just basic nature of reification in images of large-scale data sets, a sense that that aggregate has some totalizing capability that we're trying to get at. And I ask why? Because in fact, it's as if knowing everything would be useful. But you know, it's the village voice syndrome. You get to New York, you open the village voice, and you think, I have to do everything. But in fact, that's not what you want to do. You want to do anything, but do it, you know, and experience it. So the aggregate, I think, reinforces that sense of a to totality. And, and totalization models by themselves are really repellent to the humanistic experience experience, right? I mean, fascism was about total, uh, totalizing experience within which the individual aligns and therefore loses their critical apperception of humanity, and that's Adorno's critique. And, and, and so this is really significant to, in fact, pull back from the, the totalizing imagery and say, it's about, it's about knowing. It's about the experience of knowing. That's the human scale. It's not about being able to grasp the totality of everything, because that almost has no value within human experience. If you can inflect a relationship, it's about the relationship to what it is to know an aggregate, that has some significance. So where do we inflect that relationship and mark it? And again, I go back to Adorno who says, you know, unless you have a space for the inscription of subjectivity within a social system, you have fascism. And so I, I, again, I, 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 I'm not trying to say that, you know, data digitalization is fascism. I'll let somebody else say that. It's too <laughs> simplistic. But, but my point is that, again, recognizing what it is we're after, which is experiential, it's knowing, it's being, um, it's not knowledge, right? So, at least for me, it's not about knowledge, it's about knowing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a huge difference, right? Um, anyway. So, Nick, Nick, do you want to? Sure. So, I was, uh, uh, I was hoping during uh, um, Kurt's long, kind introduction to me that he would, um, he would explain uh, uh, what I had to do with visualization. Because uh, if you look at some of my, uh, some of my uh, creative work, for instance, um, you'll notice that uh, it's pretty much uh, all text. Um, and these are uh, projects that um, uh, some of them I've worked with video artists, I've done some projects that involve images uh, here and there, but um, I'm pretty, uh, pretty heavily textual and uh, engaging with computation in some ways. So from, from this sort of perspective, I'm, I'm about as qualified you know, as, as uh, Roger Ebert is to talk about whether video games are art or not. Um, <coughs> but you know, I do have this interest in my, in my uh, research that's ongoing in this interactive fiction system curve shift that deals with narrative theory and uh, creating complexities and timelines, uh, although with a textual display, um, and in platform studies that Kurt mentioned, um, looking at the way that uh, computer platforms affect uh, and uh, are affected by uh, various cultural forces. Um, and then a recent uh, code studies project um, that I'm working on with 11 others, um, analyzing a very short Commodore 64 basic program. Um, in fact, uh, this program is a, an example of a visualization of a computational process in and of itself. So our, our uh, interpretation here is uh, trying to interpret uh, something that is inherently uh, a visualization, and uh, uh, rather than using a visualization to try to understand something that is textual. But uh, but these these are projects that uh, that uh, also uh, give me some type of angle. But for the most part, it's uh, working with Mike Danziger, who'll be on the closing panel with me. Um, uh, he did his. Uh, 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 master's thesis here in CMS, I worked with him, um, that, you know, gave me a little bit of insight into what information visualization uh, is like. And uh, so I want to bring up this one distinction, which I think that uh, uh, Mike himself is not extremely keen on, but uh, that's noted and that he's, he, he and others have discussed. Um, you know, what's the difference between an information visualization system like this one here um, and uh, one like uh, this one? This is Hans Rosling. Uh, at TED in uh, 2007, 
um, showing uh, health uh, data from uh, uh, developing countries throughout the world. And uh, of course, this is uh, Chief John Anderton from uh, Minority Report. Um, so besides the fact that uh, we have a, a fictional character in one case, um, actually, uh, he's probably not controlling that interface himself at TED, so that's probably a fictional interface as well. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but this, despite that distinction, there's another important distinction, which is that uh, what is going on here in Minority Report is actually a forensic type of activity. Um, this exploration of data using visualization, using this interface. Um, is not presenting to a jury or to anyone else um, things that are going on, but he's trying to uncover this information based on data from the precogs minds. Uh, this, on the other hand, is, a, is very much a presentation. This is about as presentation as you can get. Um, it's, uh, it's rhetorically showing what it is that uh, has been discovered in this quantitative data, and it's uh, presenting it very, very well. And that's the distinction that I just want to mention here and ask uh, Joanna about. Um, is this distinction between exploration and presentation, that there are exploratory systems and uh, presentational systems. And um, sometimes they might look alike. In fact, I guess, you know, these two, if you met in a dark alley, you might be a little bit confused as to, as to which was which. Um, and, 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 you know, they have some other similarities. They're both uh, outcomes of military uh, uh, technological development and so on. But um, it's, uh, it's probably the case that the device on the right is not going to uh, help you explore Mars very well, um, ultimately. Uh, these are very adapted to different purposes. And um, um, it's true that uh, there are systems that are flexible, that work in both ways, that accomplish some of the objectives of both exploration and presentation that we see nowadays. But I like to sort of you know, drag this, um, this old uh, uh, binary of uh, exploratory and presentational systems up from the grave in fact, most of my career is dragging old binaries up from the grave um, and, uh, and, uh, and see what it has to tell us about this. Because my, my suggestion is that um, we, we may actually need to consciously focus on creating exploratory and investigative systems in the humanities. So I think both sorts of systems, uh, as uh, Joanna pointed out, should be CAPTA-driven rather than data-driven. They should be... Uh, uh, suffused with the context and the humanistic perspective that we uniquely bring. But how we actually do our work, do our inquiry, do our investigations may be different than how we present it and show it at a conference. I think there are a few of us who uh, use PowerPoint or Keynote to actually work through our thinking and uh, actually do our method, even though in the humanities we do use the process of writing. And I think the, the trace of our thinking, the trace of our process as we write, is, is fairly evident in the papers that we produce, more so than in the sciences or in engineering, where you typically do very different sorts of research and write up a report when you're done. And the writing process isn't as intimately involved with the method of inquiry that you're engaging in. Now, um, uh, what this means is that uh, a humanistic paper, you know, actually uh, conveys something about the thought process, the exploration and the inquiry that went into it. Um, and I think uh, that's something that the humanities do fairly well. I'm not sure that, um, that reading those papers to, uh, um, at a conference where you have you know, 30 parallel sessions to an average audience of three um, and reading them word for word uh, is exactly the way to go about that, perhaps. But um, uh, the humanities has some, of this, uh, has some of this right when it comes to investigation. And I think we want to bring that type of, um, of uh, discussion and revelation of inquiry into the process as we use these methods of data visualization, um, as we use other techniques to inquire into um, uh, how it is that uh, we can make sense of the world humanistically uh, using technologies, um, uh, using contexts, but also using the quantitative uh, data that we have and the processes that we have for uh, looking at that and visualizing that. Well, lots of really good points here. Um, any, anyone who wants to talk about the Night of the Living binaries is <laughs> <laughs> interesting to me. Um, first of all, just one little point, um, and that is that text is visual. 
Uh, okay, so uh, I could go back through every screen you show. I've memorized it. I could go back through every single screen and talk about the way that the artifactual evidence in those screens um, could be analyzed because of the visual characteristics there. So, um, so bad boy. Okay, but aside from that, the, the important issues here really do have to do with knowledge generation versus knowledge representation, and, and it's an important distinction and one I think we should think about it in, in, in a number of different ways because there's also the pseudo explanation exploratory. Um, okay, so dynamic, dynamic queries in pre-existing data sets are pseudo-exploratory. Right? In other words, they allow you to generate a certain kind of um, set of answers to pre-existing questions that are already quantified, but the data set is there. It's actually you know, just a multifaceted inquiry into a representation. The representation assumes, as we know, that there is a kind of knowledge that pre-exists the act and that the representation is adequate to showing what it is you think you know. So I would question all of those things because based Basically, the reading of the representation, as I'm trying to argue, is always iterative. So the, rep the notion that the representation stands in a relation of equivalence to something that's in the world, either an experience or an analysis of text or corpora or, or other information, is simply wrong. Okay, I mean, there were 25 years of deconstruction that we all went through, you know, we went through post-structuralist camp training in order to take apart that notion, and then somehow when we became digital, we forgot. Um, I didn't forget. And a lot of other people have been forgotten that, in fact, the, the, we have to critique representation always. But that's still different. That distinction still holds in, in the way that you're describing it for the way in which a system um, has affordances for actual investigation and production of something that's not literally already inscribed within it at the outset and that which, um, you know, only can produce for you alternative readings of what's literally inscribed. And here I think um, an interesting example, and some of you may know this, is the Worldwide Telescope. Anybody here familiar with the Worldwide Telescope project at IBM? Oh, it's interesting how few people are. I think it's an interesting project for humanists to look at. Microsoft, thank you. Oh my God, here I am. Like, see, I told you I know nothing about brands. Um, okay, so um, Microsoft. But the Worldwide Telescope is an attempt to take multiple um, uh, visualization techniques, infrared and, um, um, you know, uh, what are the, uh, any um, micro, uh, you know, Oh, I know there's heat visualization and light visualization and you know, all these different and mathematical models, all the different ways in which, the, um, astro in which astronomical phenomena can be given a visual form and to integrate them into a platform where you can play with looking at multiple views and you begin by the layering of views and the changing of scale to be able to examine the phenomena under investigation and you can also upload, um, citizen scientists are allowed to upload um, observations and data into this within limits. I mean, it's not really as open as all that. But the point is that the, the, the many different aspects or the different kinds of slices or views across that astronomical phenomena are, are combinatoric in this system. And the combinations often produce insights that weren't pre-existing and that's possible partly because of the scale of astronomical data. There's just so much more than we can process that letting a lot of different people sort of, it's, you know, like the, the SETI screensavers, it's like letting a lot of different people play with it um, increases the probability that, there, that something could be discovered. But the system itself is set up to allow those recombinations to take place in ways that aren't part of the pre-existing data set, right? So the combinatoric actually aggregates to something that wasn't there in advance. The difference between that, of course, and a humanistic environment is no way to humanists, you know, imagine that there is a single sky, right? I mean, you know, astronomers agree there is a single sky, more or less, mapped according to fairly standard coordinates. You couldn't get a humanist to agree to what is the Renaissance with another humanist who's, you know, talking about the Renaissance. There's no shared coordinates. So that's where it becomes interesting what are the coordinate systems that we can begin to um, uh, exhume from our interpretive understanding so that we see what these modelings, these intellectual modelings of our understandings and our arguments are, and then it's in the differences among those that we begin to see the aggregation of, of uh, you know, the knowledge generation in a productive way, I think. So, so it's a really useful distinction. So that 
there are many more questions that are coming up uh, immediately, but I think we should open it up to the audience at this point, so hopefully we can also continue the discussion afterwards, but I'd like to open it up to, to the audience and uh, if you could step out and <laughs> go to the microphones or could we get those microphones to... Uh, thanks, John, and thanks, guys. It's a, it's a great start. Um, so, John, as you know, I, on the one hand, I agree with everything you said. On the other hand, I violently disagree with everything you said. I know, I know. We've uh, been to this but, I, but, let's, but I hope I can make it. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's going to be a productive one, I hope. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, because I think the problem I have uh, with, 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 sorry, with, with your talk is that uh, you get me feeling that there is this kind of default kind of humanism, like this box. And if we can just bring it in and make visualization more interesting. But my question is, what is a human, what's a humanism, right? So we can think about Foucault, who basically postulated in one of his more provocative books that human itself was a historical construction of human sciences. Or we can think about Adorno, whom you mentioned, uh, who saw kind of humanism of uh, enlightenment leading up to culture, industry, and fascism. Uh, but let me make it more concrete. So I'm thinking about a very recent article in which you may, be, may be, or may not be familiar with by Bruno Latour, where he makes this wonderful argument that interactive visualization is what actually would allow human sciences to finally become scientific. Uh, and his argument is that uh, in the hard sciences, because there are just so many elements, right, where there are so many atoms, people had to use things like equations and generalizations but in humanities and social sciences, you know, people always used generalizations, you know, periods, genres. You know, people talked about abstract things like postmodernism, and nobody observed postmodernism, right? It's a generalization because we didn't actually have enough technology to go and observe all the actual elements and count. So he makes the argument that interactive visualization uh, is actually would finally allow uh, humanities and social sciences uh, to talk about, as you talk about large number of events and elements without abstract aggregation. Um, so there's an kind of argument here which in some ways maybe even questions that perhaps humanism was a kind of mistake because we didn't have the right technology. Anyway. Well, um, okay, so the points on which I disagree with you <laughs> in that set of remarks are, of course, I do agree that human is a, is a historical construct, and it's, co and it's constantly changing, and it's always in play, and, and we know that humans also construct their sense of themselves um, according to the um, I I articulation of an other. You know, we are other than the angels, we are other than the devils, we are other than the apes, we are other than the machines. And so, you know, we, c we can certainly look at that, and it's a very rich and interesting field. So I, I agree with you that human is a concept that's under construction. Humanism, however, is a specific historical phenomenon, and I think it's important to remember its, its historical moment as well as its historical trajectory and the fact that humanism doesn't go away with the coming of the natural sciences and empirical methods, but it becomes one among several methods. And in, in the Renaissance, those methods are much more mixed than they are as the disciplines begin to specialize and isolate themselves. The moment at which we encounter the research university and the academy is one in which those degrees of specialization have become so rarefied that I think, and, and also so um, differentiated in terms of the cultural authority that they assume, that the humanities have, have been pushed almost into a defensive posture. What good is the humanities, right? What, what use is the humanities? The humanities come to be seen as a kind of, you know, uh, a little sort of, you know, uh, backwater or a little detour, a little sort of, a little eddy off here to the side where you might contemplate, well, poetics, for instance, right? <laughs> or, or th you know, and, and, and that's not, and what I'm trying to argue is that, that for all that I believe in the study of cultural legacy materials and poetics and aesthetics, and I do believe in them and I believe in their value, I think there's a more important value for the humanities, which is, in fact, in this epistemological 
difference from, from the sciences. And what I'd say to you is that most of the fields that feel the need to append the term sciences to themselves are simply not, or they wouldn't be so, you know, in need of that appendation. Um, and that, you know, I don't think that the desire for humanists to make their work achieve a condition of certainty so that they will feel like the sciences is a desirable thing. I think there are things that humanists can do with technological means and computational means that are very useful. In other words, I can take a term, um, as in the charting of obscenity that Chris Foster was involved in, he's taking that word bitch, okay? It's a word. It's a word that appears in, in the corpus of English literature. And he's very interested in seeing how does that word transform in its meaning because of its context and its use. That is a project at a scale that you can't do unless you can automate it. It just can't be done by a human being. It can't even be done by a team of 100 human beings because it just, you, know, you have to aggregate it. So there are wonderful things, I think, and, and questions we can ask by using te technological means, but they are not, I don't think, um, to be validated by according them the, um, uh, the, the, the term certainty. In other words, I don't think this is about scientific knowledge. I think it remains a question of humanistic inquiry into the ways in which things like language are situated within circumstances of use and historicity and specificity and their performance and so forth. So, you know, I guess I would just disagree that um, I don't see that the need here is to give the humanities its final stature by making it a science, but rather to say the humanities actually have a set of principles that are foundational to interpretive inquiry that are as valid and as necessary within the cultural domain as the principles and claims to certainty which naive empiricism would assert. Most scientists would not assert that kind of naive empiricism. Most scientists and social scientists, in fact, are very critical of statistical models of knowledge as certain. And it's only the humanists who suddenly adopted these, these visualizations who suddenly think, oh, now I'm a scientist. It's like, a scientist wouldn't think that, okay? So that's, that's where the mismatch comes in. Um, but the mismatch is not because ha humanists haven't gotten it right. It's because humanists have not, I think, used the foundational principles of humanism to construct another set of interpretive tools. And I think that's what we're trying to grope towards here is what would those interpretive tools be. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Thank you. So I will, I'm stepping out, but I just want to say I think one thing which if you said, you know, with, with, it's the scientists are not to blame. It's the humanists no, who no, no, try no. to become scientists without really understanding what science, for example, for the last 150 years has been about uncertainty, probability, right? Yeah. So we actually have yeah. something, you know, uh, yeah. anyway. I don't think there's any to blame this here. Again, and I think what's interesting, truthfully, is that digital humanities is coming of age. And in the early days of digital humanities, there was a sense in which, and it's just a phrase I heard repeatedly in Virginia, we all went into the room as constructivists, you know, and came out after our conversations with our advisors as pragmatists or realists. And why? Why did we cede that ground? And when Bethany and I started to do temporal modeling, you cannot imagine the amount of resistance that generated. You know, a visualization is not accurate. It's not a data set. You're, how are you going to be sure what you're showing? It's all subjective. It's all, and it's like, and the problem is what? You know, but really it was, you know, we came up against so much resistance. Um, the anxiety about certainty is huge. And I said, I just happened to, you know, be missing that gene. So. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, you gave me a keyword, certainty. Um, the book by Grafton and Rosenberg yeah. does not cite a lot of the sources. There is no inventory numbers. There is no full citation of many of the visualizations they do. So it's basically from the point of view of a traditional humanist useless. So what's your take on that? And let me, let me do the same to a listen. I think the Republic of the Letters project is a very nice project, only it does a simplification, but there's nothing wrong with simplification as long as you state it is a simplification. Because I think that if we, if we say, you know, 
humanities are vague and we are right and you cannot, you cannot argue against it, I think we're going, we, we, we end up in something which is much more and much more dangerous because it's a defined global view which is what fascism is. It was, it was basically something that was put on top of society which was defined by other people. And what those people want to find out who count is actually to look at the emergence of structure which we don't yet know. But we have to actually look at the data, we have to count, we have to look at all this stuff. And if we don't do that, we, we will end up in a vague universe of everybody can say what he or she wants. And I think that is okay, but that's not science or research, right? Well, um, I guess I would suggest that I, I wasn't trying to um, equate humanistic interpretation with vagueness. In other words, humanistic methods are very rigorous. And if you, you know, if you practice any kind of textual analysis or close reading or historical work, you know that's true. And you're quite right about your critique of the Grafton and Rosenberg. You, you, um, I didn't feel I wanted to, to go there, but you know, it, uh, but your 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 critique is accurate and it's correct. And um, it is a shortcoming of that process project that it's really sort of a you know an exhibition rather than a than a scholarly text in that sense and I, I have other you know sort of doubts about it but it's still a wonderful picture book and, and very nice to look at and they've done a lot of work to pull all that together so um, but uh, it, in that sense it's actually reflective of a lot of work that gets done in the digital environment which is a kind of cut and paste and I don't need to you know sort of recall the the, tra the source from which this came and so forth um, technique so you're, 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 you're completely right on that point but um, the issue I think was, um, and I don't want to again take Republic of Letters too much to task because it's an interesting project and an ambitious one um, and, and worthy of a great deal of, of serious conversation. But I think to me the, the question is what does the image reify through its representation and it becomes so rhetorically forceful that again we, we take the image for the thing itself. We take the characteristics of the image as representative of the nature of that phenomenon and in that sense it's a, it's, it's a terrible misrepresentation um, in, in so many ways because first of all well, you know, the, the, the way in which the, um, the if, if, if one of the questions at the heart of a project like Republic of Letters is how does a community const itself through communication and epistolary exchange, then the material conditions of epistolary, epistolary exchange seem to me to be central to that project as well as the nature of the, um, the remaining witnesses. What percentage of witnesses history privileges the famous? What about the missing letters? What about the, what, you know, what fragment of the corpus are we seeing? In other words, and, and all of that in a textual study is likely to be m more clear through the nuance and discussion, but an image, because it is reductive and has a simplification, um, glosses over that, renders these things each equivalent in terms of their path through time and space, and then doesn't allow us the kind of query that we would like to make. And it's, it's also, it is an image, it's not a query s s system. But so I guess to me it's the reifying force, rhetorical force, of images in their reductiveness that, that makes me dissatisfied with the um, argument that they seem to present. So again, that's, that's my, you know, issue with it. But, um, you know, I, I, if you find the simplification useful for making a particular case, then, then that seems justified, again, so long as we're clear on what the case is. Um, we just don't want to, again, the, the uh, images are constructs, they aren't you know, the thing itself. And it, it's that confusion. You know, any digital image, any, me, you know, not even just a visualization, but any mediated image. When somebody says to me, there it is, there's the manuscript on the screen, it's like, that's not the manuscript on the screen. That's not the thing itself. It's a highly mediated artifact of a particular set of technological conditions and circumstances. So, but uh, what was your comment? What were you going to say? Everything you say. In what sense? Everything you do has uh, is subject to the same critique you bring against this image. If I read a text, if I read a sonnet by Shakespeare, right, and then the person next to me reads, in, in other words, the, the text is not a self-evident artifact ever. I thought the text was visual. 
It is visual. <laughs> <laughs> it's visual and it's performed. Text and images have different force, um, especially in the aggregation. Um, you can make a simplified statement in a text, but I think image visualizations in the, in, uh, I'll make a gross generalization, image visualizations in the, in digital humanities have tended to a great extent to make use of aggregated data to present some kind of reduced visualization from them. And, and because it's useful, okay, and it is useful. You know, that, I mean, chapter one of Tufty, right, it's, Lots of information represented in a legible and simple way so that you can see some kind of pattern or form in that data. And that's not what texts do. I mean, a text can be put to that service, but that's certainly not what literary or historical texts do. And they are, they are artifactual in themselves. So. so I think in the matter of time, um, you know, there's one last question from the audience. Hi, yeah, Ian Condry with uh, uh, Comparative Media Studies. Uh, thank you, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to pick up on one of the threads you mentioned in terms of uh, ways to expand on thinking about data and visualization, or CAPTA and digitalization, or visualization. Uh, in terms of emergent phenomena, uh, I guess, you know, one of the things that I notice, and I'm beginning to wonder if it's related to the, the, uh, the dominance of PowerPoint or Keynote or these other slide-based uh, ways of presenting things that a lot of the visualizations tend to be static. Uh, and that I, I'm, I guess what I'm curious, and yet, you know, if we think about sort of how our, our experience of a week happens and the emotions that happen, that in fact what happened on Monday then influences what happens on Tuesday and the length of time on the train then influences the future, that there is that kind of unfolding, emergent, both I know what happened but I don't know what's going to happen aspect to the human experience. Uh, this seems very difficult to capture when you make put it within a frame on a piece of paper, say, or on a, a, a light lit up uh, data projector. So I guess what, I'm, what I want to ask is, are there ways in which representing or either exploring or presenting uh, this kind of emergent phenomenon through uh, visualization, are there successful or interesting examples of how we might do that or models we might look to that show promising directions to explore? Sure, it's a really valid point, and, uh, and of course you're right, and uh, you can't show codependent and emergent phenomena in static space, you can just show snapshots across the continuum of time, and after all, what happened on Tuesday also influences what happened on Monday, and, 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 and that's where it gets interesting, right, because you know, it, it's that, you know, sort of um, the whole field of interrelated um, event spaces that actually we do experience, and, you know, the betrayal that happens on Wednesday morning suddenly makes you realize that what happened on Monday evening was just not what you thought it was. And so these are really important issues in terms of lived experience. Um, we know them well. And um, so, uh, so I think the answer is actually, um, you know, dynamic modeling. And my favorite is weather systems. I mean, I do think that, you know, because of the complexity of the modeling of fluid dynamics of the atmosphere, weather is a really great model for thinking about how to, to do this, and so I actually did a project when I was the Digital Cultures Fellow at UC Santa Barbara called Subjective Meteorology, in which I took the metaphors and templates of traditional meteorology to use them as a way to create a scheme for showing subjective experience. Now, you know, I was doing little animations that I was making and erasing and, and putting down on a scanner so I could animate them in, in, you know, sort of in a pseudo way, but it's a project I really want to go back to, because I think it's you know, it's really fun and, and I do think we need that level of, of complexity to, to deal with, you know, and I, I, I know some people right at this table are going to build this <laughs> kind of stuff. And, but your point is absolutely right and, and it has to be a, a, a system that, it, that works in two directions. It can't just be that my intervention changes that. There has to be a, a back and forth of constraints. So unfortunately, we have to close the panel here, but thanks a lot, Johanna, for... Thank you all. <laughs>